This afternoon's sermon is on Isaiah chapter 6. Now, originally, we were going to have Isaiah, I'm sorry, this week is Isaiah 7. This was going to be Isaiah 6, and Rod was going to preach, and then next week I was going to be preaching this on Isaiah 7, but for obvious reasons, Rod is under the weather today, we switched, but I think that switch will work just fine. This chapter has one verse in it that is probably more familiar than any of the, of the other verses that surround it. And the reason it is so familiar to us is that it is quoted in a very prominent place in the New Testament. So before we look at Isaiah 7, we're going to read a very familiar passage from one of the Gospels. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the very first chapter of Matthew. And we're going to read verses 18 to 23. Did I walk up here without my Bible? I guess I did. Matthew chapter 1, 18 to 23. And when we're finished reading that passage, please keep your Bible open there because we're going to look at something else there before we go into Isaiah. So here's Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. <clears throat> but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The events we see unfolding in this passage are described as taking place to fulfill the words of the prophet. The prophet was Isaiah. And the words cited in Matthew 1 are spoken in Isaiah 7. But before we turn to Isaiah 7, let's take one more look at one more thing in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew opens with a genealogy, and verses 6 to 11 recall the line of Christ's ancestry picking up with King David and extending to the time of Judah's, Judah's exile in Babylon. And this will be significant for our understanding of Isaiah 6. So let's read that passage beginning at verse, uh, beginning at verse uh, 6. And Jesse, the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam the father of Abijah. And Abijah the father of Asaph. And Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat the father of Joram. And Joram the father of... Uzziah. Now, if Rod had been preaching in Isaiah 6 this week, he would have said, he started with the words, in the year that King Uzziah died. But we'll get that next week. Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz. There's a critical name for us, Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of deportation to Babylon. Okay, let's open, let's turn in our Bibles now to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Now, Isaiah chapter 7 is a rough chapter, it really is. It takes place during a time of turmoil in Judah's history, in, both in Judah, turmoil in Judah and, Ju and turmoil in the region surrounding it. It takes place during the, king, to, during the reign of King Ahaz, who was not a good king of Judah. His father and his son 
both followed the Lord better than he did, but Ahaz was a particularly wicked king of Israel. Um, nestled in Isaiah 7 are prophecies of hope, unspeakable hope. But the overall tenor of this chapter is one of judgment. So let's read Isaiah 7, and we'll just start with verses 1 and 2. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel. Now here, Israel is referring to the northern kingdom. Also in this passage, we'll see the northern kingdom referred to as Ephraim. So Rezin, king of Israel, uh, I'm sorry, Pekah and Rezin came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it but could not yet mount an attack against it. <coughs> when the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, that is to say the northern kingdom, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So we see in this chapter, in, in, in this passage, three characters. We've got Ahaz, who is the king of Judah. We've got Pekah, the king of Israel, that is the northern kingdom, Ephraim, and Rezin, the king of Syria. Now, Syria lies to the north of the northern kingdom of Israel. In fact, I understand that certainly a part of Syria's territory was within the kingdom of King David, but so, so Syria is in that region. Three characters, all kings, all in neighboring nations. There's a fourth person lurking in the shadows, who is not mentioned in this passage, certainly not mentioned by name. He is another king, the king of Assyria, and his name is Tiglath Pileser. Now, we shouldn't mistake Syria and Assyria. Syria is just north of the northern kingdom. I'm going your image here. Assyria is further east and north, and, uh, and, and this nation, Assyria, has the ambition to expand its territory. And this is what has motivated an alliance between Israel's northern kingdom, Ephraim or, or Israel, and Syria, who are resisting the expansion of Assyria into their territories. These two kings want to have Judah join them in their alliance. They want a united front in that region against Assyria. But King Ahaz is not inclined to go along. Before long, we actually see him courting the favor of the king of Assyria, which makes him the enemy of the northern kingdom and of Syria. And so these latter two kingdoms have attacked Judah, and they've done much damage, but they've not been able to capture Jerusalem. And now there is evidence that further attacks from these two northern neighbors are ramping up and Judah together with King Ahaz looking at the damage that was done in their last military campaign. They're in a state of fear. And it's onto this stage that Isaiah steps. That's, that's the context given to us in verses 1 and 2. So now let's look at verses 3 to 9 of chapter 7. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. At the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord your God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. 
If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. I've already said that this chapter is a chapter of both judgment and a chapter of grace. The Lord instructs Isaiah to bring along his son, and the only thing we're told about this son is his name. That's all we ever learn about him in the scriptures. His name is a pronouncement of both judgment and grace. The name Shir Jashub means a remnant shall return. The hope of a remnant is a declaration of coming grace. But the fact that this language is on the table at all speaks of the future crushing of Judah by its enemies and an exile from which we see only a remnant returning. But a remnant shall return. And we have dealt with this at length in, in recent weeks as we have looked at the returning of the, of the remnant in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So we know that God is going to be faithful to this promise, but the presence of Isaiah's prophetically named son in this scenario is ominous. Isaiah's command to Ahaz is to be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. This is not a call to a state of denial. Isaiah is not singing, don't worry, be happy. He is calling Ahaz to faith in God. Specifically, he is calling Ahaz to embrace the promise that God has made to David and his descendants. And I hope that Alex's words from 2 Samuel are ringing in your ears. What rich, rich promises God gave to David and to those of his descendants who would walk in obedience and faith. These promises were conditional on faith and obedience to God, but they were tremendously significant promises. So the subtext here is this. Do not enter into an ungodly alliance with Assyria. Do not put your faith in man. Put your faith in God. And the end of verse 9 is direct. If you are not firm in faith, in godly faith, you will not be firm at all. Now the Lord, through Isaiah, speaks of these kings that are threatening invasion. He speaks of them contemptuously. He calls them smoldering stumps of firebrands. What's he saying? They're spent. They have no future. He does not even grant to the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, he doesn't even grant this king the dignity of being called by his own name. He is called the son of Remaliah, as if his own name is not even worth remembering. But also, remember that Ahaz, to whom Isaiah is speaking, is someone's son. He's David's son. He is in the royal line to whom huge promises have been made. And indeed, the intent of the enemies of the north, Syria and, and, and northern Israel, their intent is to unseat the Davidic dynasty and to set their own puppet ruler up in its place. And they will not succeed. Five more kings of the house of David will follow Ahaz before the exile. Within 65 years, Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom, will be shattered from being a people. Now certainly their defeat took place earlier than that, but that time frame was consistent with Assyria resettling the land of Ephraim with people that they had displaced through other conquests, and this sealed the fate of the northern, Inca, the northern, the northern kingdom. It was finished. By the time of Jesus, we see the Samaritans to the north of Judea. These were people of mixed ancestry, these were people who had no claim to the heritage of Israel. And so Isaiah is calling Ahaz to faith, not in the strength of man, but in the promises of God. If you are not firm in faith, 
you will not be firm at all. We don't know how much time passes between verses 9 and 10. Perhaps verse 10 follows immediately. Perhaps this is a subsequent meeting. In any case, Isaiah again calls to Ahaz. He calls Ahaz to faith, to trust in God. So let's read verses 10 to 17. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be, as, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he, that is Isaiah, said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary man, that you weary God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and to choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. For the Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. The Lord is saying to Ahaz, Trust me. I am prepared to move heaven and earth to give you assurance of my readiness to honor the promise that I made to your father. To your father David, test me and see if I will not pour out a blessing. But the mind of King Ahaz is made up. He feigns piety by saying that, oh, I will not put the Lord God to the test. But his intent is to abandon faith in God and to put his faith in the king of Assyria. This will have disastrous consequences for Israel because Assyria has absolutely no intention of honoring any terms of any treaty that they enter into. No intention of acting in good faith. Ahaz is not firm in faith. He has is not firm at all. So Isaiah rebukes Ahaz. He addresses him, naming him as the house of David, but now his words are a response to Ahaz's faithlessness. Verse 13, and he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too weary, is it too little for you to weary man, that you weary my God also? And then the Lord, through Isaiah, proceeds to pronounce a curse upon Ahaz. A curse of disastrous proportions for him and for his people. But now our heads start to spin. Because the first words of the curse are words that prove to be words of unspeakable blessing to all who will ever put their trust in God. They are wondrous words. They are words that speak of God dwelling in the midst of men. They are words that speak of the means by which God will rescue us, by which he will deliver us, by which he will give us a hope and a future. They are words that we know and treasure. They are the foundation of a galaxy of promises that God makes to believers of all time. They are at least on par with the magnificent promises God made to his servant David. They lead us to marvel. They lead us to bow in God's presence, in worship, in awe, in gratitude. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. But these are not words of hope and promise for Ahaz or for any of those around him who are abandoning faith in God and vainly putting their hopes in man. What did these words mean to them? Well, let's read a little more of the context again. We're going to pick up back at verse 13, which we've already read, but we'll read it again. 
and go to the end of the chapter. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary man, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat courage and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. In, all, in that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds, for everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, every such place will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for the hills that used to be hoed with the hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. For Ahaz and his ungodly followers, these words simply represent a time frame. In the space of time it will take for an unmarried virgin to marry, to conceive a child, and to raise that child to maybe the age of two or three years, disaster will come on these lands. Assyria, in whom Ahaz is putting his hope, will devastate the land. The land will be largely deserted. The cultivation of fields and vineyards will come to a halt. The populous of the land will be sustained by the monotonous diet of poverty, curds and honey. The settling of the bee, the settling in of the bee from Assyria and the fly from Egypt is a picture of occupying forces in the land. The shaving of the head and the hair of the feet and the beard are symbols of humiliation. Great devastation lies at hand. And the consequences of, of Ahaz's unfaithfulness would be far-reaching. A handful of kings in the line of David would yet sit on the throne of Judah, but after that, the throne of David, for all practical purposes, would become meaningless. By the time Jesus came, which was about 600 years after Judah had later fallen to Babylon, by the time Jesus came, there had been significant agricultural and economic recovery from the very worst of those years. But Judea was still constituted by people under the domination of a foreign empire. There was still a hope in the coming of a deliverer, the coming of the son of David who would restore the fortunes of Israel, but at the time that Jesus, as a young child, was at the age where we expect children to be beginning to be capable of a measure of moral judgment, by the time Jesus was that age, the image of a monotonous diet of poverty was not out of place, considering the reality of Judah's plight as a nation as compared with its earlier days at the realm under the rule of the house of David. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, let's go back to Matthew. Let's read exactly what we read at the opening of this message. Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. 
And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwill unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Matthew's words carry no hint of divine judgment or condemnation. Now, truly, the display of the glory of God in the face of Christ will bring greater guilt, greater judgment on all who reject him. But that is not what is in view in this passage. What is in view here is the gracious working of God to redeem his people. And certainly here, we see the working of God. Just as in the first sentence of the, of the book of Genesis, we see the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters, and out of that comes the creation of life on the face of the earth and the creation of the first Adam. So in the New Testament, we see the Spirit of God bringing forth life, bringing forth the second Adam. By his divine creative power in the womb of Mary, the angel whom we see appearing to Mary in the Gospel of Luke speaks these words, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The scriptures are clear that the conception of the child in Mary's womb did not come about by natural means. Rather, it was the begetting of life in one who truly was still a virgin. Both Matthew and Luke as gospel writers, writers are committed to this reality. And this reality, the virgin birth of Christ, is important for a number of reasons. We understand from the scriptures that Jesus was God incarnate, God made flesh. Philippians 2 teaches us that God the Son, who was in very nature God, did not count equality, equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. We understand that Jesus, being conceived of the Holy Spirit, did not inherit the guilt of Adam. This, together with his sinless life, made him eligible to be the sin bearer for others in his death. Only one with no debt of sin of his own could bear our sin and deliver us from death and wrath. But it's still true that Jesus was fully a man, and that is vitally important, as the wrath that he bore was for human sin, even though it was not his own. The sin of man was paid for by the life of a man. And for that matter, the life of righteousness he lived was the life of a man. And that is tied up in the precious truth that his righteousness is credited to us when we are joined to him. And what is more, as a man, he is a descendant of David. Such that the promises made to David will be fulfilled by him and in him. And so in Luke's account, we read the, works, the words of the angel to Mary, he will be great and we will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. The child of Mary was named Jesus, which means the Lord saves. And Matthew sees no contradiction between this and the prophecy of the child receiving a name that meant God with us. 
Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Isaiah, in today's passage, called Ahaz not to put his hope in human might, but to embrace the truth and the promises of God. The promises that were, were made most conspicuous in this call were those that were made to Ahaz's ancestor, King David. But the, those promises extended to all the descendants of David who would walk before God in faith and obedience. So in Ahaz's, in Isaiah today, we see Isaiah calling Ahaz to put his faith in God. And today, I call you to place your hope not in human wisdom or in human might, but to place your hope in the person and the promises of God revealed to us in Christ. And we are in possessions of better promises than those that were made to Ahaz. We have laid out before us promises of cleansing from guilt, deliverance from wrath, friendship with God. Victory over even death. Life forever in the presence of God, realized through the resurrection of our bodies. And I understand this to be a timely and a pertinent call. Now I perceive that possibly every one of you to whom I'm speaking to this day this, has the intention of walking in the ways of God, living lives of faith and obedience. I understand that, but the pull of the world and the pull of the flesh are real. And you will not escape having to confront them. You just won't. I've lived long enough to see people whom I understood to be in the pathway of faith abandon that pathway for all intents and purposes, and it breaks my heart. We understand ourselves here to embrace the Reformed tradition. And the Reformed tradition places a high value on believing in the sovereignty of God in salvation. But we do not embrace the idea that the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man somehow exist in contradiction to each other. So, on one hand, I anticipate that when I finally stand in the presence of God, I will have no basis for pride, no basis for conceit, for it will not have been my good intentions in the direction of faith and obedience that will have earned me a standing of righteous in the sight of God. That's not the substance of my standing before God. But nonetheless, I am faced in an ongoing way with the call to faith and to obedience. And I have an obligation to respond in faith to that call again and again. I do have responsibility before God. You can expect to face the necessity in the months in the years ahead of embracing faithfulness in the face of what prevent, present themselves as compelling alternatives. The ungodly desires of the flesh, as described in the scriptures, will confront you. They will. The wisdom of man that sets it against the wisdom of God will commend itself to you. But it's more than this. The scriptures tell us in Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so my call to you with all my heart is the call that Isaiah made to Ahaz. When the call seems compelling to place your faith in something other than the goodness of God 
and his ways. Place your faith in God. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. <clears throat> I say these things not to unsettle you, not to frighten you, but rather to call you to courage. There's no use in being that naive about the temptations that will come to face us. But we are given the assurance that when we find ourselves under duress, God himself is with us. God in Christ is with us. God in Christ is with us. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The very last words in the book of Matthew coming from the lips of Christ are these. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end, VH. Let's pray.